Ladies and gentlemen, let me firstly thank the organizers um, for having invited me here uh, today. Uh, it's a great pleasure always for me for being back, um, partly for the reason uh, that I'm seeing, seeing the friends again. Um, I will talk uh, specifically on security of energy supply in the region. And when I heard the presentation before, um, there's a lot of points where I would certainly um, agree with the representative of the commission. Um, but uh, I have also to say, coming from a country like Germany, which had phased out nuclear power, which has speed up uh, the expansion of renewables, uh, we have uh, both, I think, the government, and as I would also add to some extent also this commission, have greatly underestimated many of the problems uh, on, the, on the transformation uh, towards uh, non-fossil uh, fuel uh, world. The realities um, and the problems and changes uh, we have undertaken in Germany uh, have brought us to a point uh, where the major problems and challenges we have not uh, solved. And I could go on here uh, in my presentation and elaborate on that because there are a lot of points, I think, um, on which other countries which will follow up, which uh, also have to follow up, uh, Germany um, will definitely, uh, uh, can definitely learn. But what I wanted uh, to do um, is focusing on security of the supply in two major aspects. Uh, one is, um, has to do um, with the dependence of coal on the Visegrad states, uh, and the other one is specifically related um, to the gas sector again. You see here um, the, um, the forecast of the increase of the EU import dependency up to the year 2030. Um, which uh, highlights uh, the major changes uh, being uh, underway. If you compare that um, with the newest de uh, developments, for example, in the United States, um, we had always, since the 1960s, discussion in the US about uh, energy autarky, um, decreasing dependence from, e e uh, from imports. That has never become through, uh, uh, true. Um, these hopes had always disappeared over the, uh, over the years and decades. Only over the last two, three years, thanks to the shale gas revolution, uh, the situation has tremendously changed in the US. Um, if you're familiar with the figures, uh, the share of coal uh, has reached a historical low share, uh, going back from 42 to 34 uh, percent. The United States had been able to decrease uh, the greenhouse gas emission over the last five years by remarkably 77% more than any other country in the world. Um, and it has brought down uh, the economic costs of gas going down from approximately eight US dollars um, down um, to uh, even less than two US dollars uh, per million uh, British terminal units uh, last, uh, last April. Um, nothing uh, suggests that we will uh, be able to go uh, the US way so far. That's a challenge uh, we face. You see the overall total import dependence we, we face. And of course, um, there are very differences. And here in the Visegrad countries, in particular in Poland, uh, security of supply has always played a much larger and more prominent role uh, than, for example, in Germany. And that has also to do with the uh, still high share of solid fuels and coal in the country's energy mix, as you can see here, when you compare that with the overall share of the EU27 member states. There's a new report, a new study came out um, by Ernest and Young on behalf of the Central East European Energy Partners, which concluded that on the way the transformation um, we have heard uh, the EU will go, uh, rightly uh, go, um, the Visegrad countries and the Central East European energy, uh, Central East European countries will have to pay a disproportional uh, share of the cost in comparison with other EU members, and that has a, a lot to do um, with the coal share in the fuel, uh, in, in the energy mixes. And here's to say that what needs uh, to make very clear to also to what my own countryman, which believes uh, that we are already on the way to uh, uh, a world um, and to uh, Europe um, uh, which wouldn't use uh, coal any longer. Nothing um, is true, as you will see uh, in a minute. The major challenge we face on the energy policies, uh, practically speaking, you can see here with the so-called energy triangle and the three objectives um, of energy security. 
uh, namely uh, sustainability, environmental reasons, economic competitiveness, and security of supply. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, um, environmental uh, and uh, climate uh, issues um, have uh, played a much larger role in determining our energy policies, particularly in my own country over the last 10 years, uh, than uh, it should be, because uh, governments need uh, to take into account all three major objectives. And that's the basic challenge for governments, which are often only able to focus on one of those factors instead of balancing all three factors. Uh, energy security um, uh, on a national, regional, as well as global level will only be achievable um, in a sustainable way if we balance all three uh, issues. And um, you should uh, um, just, if you look through uh, the media reports um, and newspapers of the energy discussions here in Europe, in your own country, whether governments have always all three factors into the uh, mind. Um, there are two new factors which make the picture even more complicated, and that has firstly to do with the technological industrial policies linked with the renewables. And one major issue is coming increasingly up. We see that in shale gas, but we see it in other areas too. And that has to do with public acceptance. In Germany, we have a situation where almost everything is being blocked. Uh, it's no longer that you have any NGOs moving, uh, moving and demonstrating against nuclear power stations. They also demonstrate against coal power stations uh, and even uh, renewables um, built it on land such as wind power, such as solar power. Um, everything is blocked, including the expansion of the grid system. Um, and so local the NIMBYism um, is becoming a widespread uh, concern uh, and become a major investment risk um, for both uh, domestic as well as uh, for foreign uh, companies. Um, and in this respect, uh, I think um, governments need to cope up with that kind of nimbyism and the public acceptance um, and uh, having no real uh, adequate response um, strategy so far. Um, when I was speaking about uh, the fact uh, that the world will definitely uh, not move uh, or coming uh, free out of coal. You can see here uh, one of my favorite slides. When I'm normally asking uh, the audiences um, which is the energy source which have increased globally the uh, during the last decade at most, you can be sure that 90% of the answers you get are always wrong. Yeah? And you see here it is coal. Coal has increased almost as much as all other energy sources all together on a global scale. So there will be no world without coal. Um, and there will be, of course, also not uh, the, uh, the Central East European countries without coal. Uh, you can uh, certainly, uh, and we should do, reduce the share of coal. But at the same time, you have to introduce clean coal technologies, CCS. Otherwise, you will not be able to achieve your, your long-term um, climate target goals of bringing down the emissions of 85-90%. You can see here an overview, um, and I will go rush through my slides, which are available afterwards, um, just of the energy mixes of the four Visegrad uh, countries, highlighting the high dependence on f uh, fossil fuels and particularly um, coal. In respect uh, to gas, you can see here um, a slide which uh, already offers um, um, a, a glimpse into the future uh, because it is showing that we, are, that we are already on the way in diversifying uh, the gas imports um, much more than it's often being realized and that has to do with the expansion of LNG. The terminal in Croatia had been mentioned, I could uh, add uh, a a terminal uh, Poland, this building near the German border, Estonia will probably build another one. So the share of LNG offers uh, um, um, a way of diversifying uh, the imports um, and much more than in the past because LNG has become uh, much more competitive uh, towards um, pipeline gas, particularly coming from Russia. You see here is the total imports and domestic consumption of natural gas in 2010, and you see that your own country as well as uh, the other three Visegrad states are still very much dependent, uh, extremely dependent on the imports uh, of Russia. 
and that has become a political issue, not just in regard to the uh, energy and gas crisis uh, we have experienced um, since uh, 2006. Quite recently, if you look to the negotiations, when Russia had to adapt uh, to uh, reduce its gas prices more along uh, the spot markets here in Europe, is an indicator uh, of uh, the problems uh, and the directions um, we will face in the coming years where Russian gas has already become uh, the most uh, expensive option for European gas consumption and that will tremendously increase in the years ahead uh, and that limits the room of maneuver on the Russian side because the future uh, pipeline gas from Russia will come from new very very expensive gas fields um, being determined uh, in regard to the investigate uh, to investments um, at a time before 2006 under uh, very uh, different uh, circumstances uh, of investments um, and now Russia has to rely on these future Russian uh, gas fields developments which are extremely uh, as I said much much more expensive uh, than the present fields and also the transport ways are much longer so um, Russian gas uh, understandably from th that point um, um, has become uh, and will become ever more um, uh, expensive um, and, uh, it, and that uh, has to be evaluated uh, against new gas options uh, we have uh, here uh, in Europe, as I will introduce in a minute. You see here is the total primary energy demand um, with uh, three uh, uh, scenarios. I included here the comparative scenario, which is here linked, the 450 scenario to the official climate policies. The IEA is still arguing this is not uh, the realistic scenario. We are very far from that kind of scenario, both on a global level as well as in re as respect to the EU. But you see how the energy mixes uh, are different uh, as well as uh, the overall energy uh, demand. In respect to the EU gas forecast, um, most of the pipeline discussions we had here in Europe are very much delinked from the question um, what the actual uh, gas demand is. And most of the figures you still hear, particularly from the gas industry, are still inflated. They go back to the years 2004, 2005 um, under circumstances which were very different from today. If the EU is able um, to uh, implement the three 20 percentage uh, goals to expand renewables up to 20 percent, which appears realistic. Efficiency, we will not probably ch achieve that kind of goal, but even if we reach, uh, let's say, uh, 10 or 15 percent, it will boil down that the overall energy demand as well as the gas demand will significantly uh, going down. You can see here is the natural gas imports uh, under two different scenarios uh, linked with the development of the oil prices. Um, and uh, those uh, figures are far below uh, the 500 uh, demand import figure uh, of the IEA and other institutions which are based um, on uh, circumstances um, which have much more changed than it's often realized. You can see here diversification of non-Russian gas uh, pipelines. You see, um, going back on the right side, the 370 is uh, a figure of the import demand that's of course far below the 500 figure and if you take that into account and add and uh, see the non-Russian gas pipeline projects um, not including the LNG options um, but then add uh, the LNG options you come up with a figure of more than 300 billion cubic meters of non-Russian um, gas imports ca uh, cap uh, capabilities so theoretically we can uh, tremendously um, decrease uh, the dependence um, from Russia. And the situation for Russia has become even more complicated, but for a long time, um, Gazprom has paid much more attention uh, to the high gas prices rather than to preserving and maintaining its market shares. Actually, its market share has gone down over the last years, uh, and meanwhile is tremendously seen um, uh, as a major challenge in the years ahead. You can see here the expansion of LNG, the share of LNG is growing up to the year 2020, here predicted by the German, by the Deutsche Bank, going up from 10 to 20 percent of the overall natural gas uh, demand. Um, and that would add uh, even more uh, uh, some factors. Uh, given the, the shale gas revolution in the United States, uh, America may become even a net gas uh, exporter in 2016. That's the reason why 
Poland, the Baltic states, uh, Japan and others are already negotiating imports of natural gas from the United States based on the shale gas revolution. Other countries such as Australia uh, tremendously expand um, uh, their gas production. Um, Australia will probably become uh, the biggest LNG producer surpassing Qatar around 2018. Brazil and Argentina, Argentina has one of the largest shale gas um, reserves. Uh, it's not clear whether they will go that way. Um, but they could also become an LNG exporter, offering much more gas to the global markets. Furthermore, as we all know, Nabucco, uh, the Tana pipeline, uh, will definitely be built in one or another way. There are import possibilities from uh, Kurdistan in Iraq, and as well as new potential offshore gas imports from the e uh, economic exclusive zones in the Black Sea, from Bulgaria, Romania, as well as Greece. Um, and you can see that uh, here on a slide, uh, the gas fields and the offshore uh, areas of the Black Sea belonging to Bulgaria and Romania. And you see, on the other hand, in the East Mediterranean Sea, also there is a resource conflict, um, um, but uh, Israel may become also a net exporter of gas. And there are already discussions uh, and plans underway of building a pipeline from uh, those gas fields in Cyprus and Lebanon in Israel uh, to uh, Greece and then transport it further uh, to Italy. And all these options are, of course, not cheap, but they will definitely, definitely be cheaper than uh, the future Russian pipeline gas. Um, and then add, uh, adding here the dimension of shale gas, and for reasons of time, I cannot go too much here in the details, but I'm very dissatisfied with the overall way of discussion we uh, focusing and discussing this thing. We're focusing very often on the risk uh, rather than on the benefits, and we are sticking too much, uh, I think, uh, to present data, to present um, developments, but most of those data are already two years old when, I, when, when we're comparing that with the United States. Uh, and of course, you cannot compare the situation here in Europe in regard to the shale gas revolution uh, with the United States. You should really compare that with the United States uh, at the beginning and the infancy of that development going back to the year 2006 when you had uh, quite similar uncertainties and problems on the US side as we are discussing here today. Uh, for Europe. One uh, example of that uh, is related uh, to Poland, when Poland came out with its first official estimate of shale gas, which was very disappointing. Yeah, and everybody was citing that this is a proof that the shale gas rev uh, revolution or even evolution could not replicate it. Um, but um, actually, that kind of assessment were just based on archive materials of old data of the 1960s and 70s. It did not include any of the new data based on the test drilling, which will only be available um, in the next two, uh, two, three years. If you look to new geological studies um, being made also with new technologies in Europe, such as in Germany, such as in the United uh, Kingdom, you see that the overall availability um, of shale gas resources um, are much higher than previous assessments uh, being made in Germany and UK. That has to do with new technologies uh, being adopted. Uh, resources and reserves are not so much a static figure. They have a lot to do with the technologies. We didn't have uh, shale gas resources uh, nominated in publications in 2006. Only when the technologies became available that you can explore them. Uh, then uh, also the figures went up on the resource side and some of those figures had been transferred to the reserve side being explorable. And the same, we need to take a more strategic perspective here into account um, by seeing also the huge um, money and funds are going in the research of the drilling technologies, of the fracturing technologies, including in coping with the environmental risk. And that kind of investment has just started uh, one or two years ago. And the next generation of those fracking technologies promise to reduce the cost per um, explored well by another up to 70%. And they will also cope and reduce the chemicals being used. Some in the future, probably no chemicals will be used uh, as well as. So you, 
all the historical experience we had in the past with fossil fuels suggests that for a long time, in the first uh, phase, for a long time, the resources as well as the reserves will go up, go up alongside of the technological innovation of the drilling technologies. Yeah? And only after a longer time of several decades, it will uh, going down. So we need to take here a much, um, a much more strategic perspectives into account and not focusing on, on present technologies which will be outdated already in three, four years. Yeah? Um, so it brings me uh, more or less to, to the end and, and I go over here to some of those developments. There's one factor, as I mentioned, um, uh, in, re in regard to the prices, um, when I was introducing the gas prices uh, of the United States uh, and compared with uh, Europe, um, with the two US dollars compared with eight, eight to 11 uh, dollars here in Europe. That kind of gap in the gas prices will definitely have a huge impact on the future overall economic competitiveness uh, of the European industry. We see that very clearly already today with the energy intensive industry um, uh, in Europe, um, which will become ever less competitive. There's huge concern in the sh uh, German uh, chemical industry, meanwhile. Um, and if we won't be able to address that kind of problem, that industry will definitely go away from Europe as well as from my own country. So uh, this is a huge challenge uh, we face in respect to the gas prices. Uh, and therefore, um, shale gas, even when it is more uh, it will be not so cheap as in the United States. It will definitely be much cheaper than future Russian gas. And so this is not just an issue of security of supply. It will also become increasingly an issue of economic competitiveness. Uh, and as I said, we have various op options today, um, particularly against the, backside, um, the background uh, that the gas demand uh, will rather go down. Uh, the figures, are new figures, even on oil or gas, are not so high as in the past. There are various other options which, which we have available, um, which will not just diversify our imports, it will also be able uh, to reduce uh, the prices. So in this respect, uh, shale gas has even become already a game changer in a way because it has empowered European companies, even its oldest uh, gas partners, such as uh, E.ON Ruhrgas, of reducing the gas prices in the negotiations with, Rus with Russia, although Russia hasn't really given up the linkage to the oil prices. So I stop here for reasons of time. Uh, the uh, presentation will be available, so you can take certainly a look to the more details um, I have put on the slides. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>